experiences. And this thing is just a construct. Right? And here's how it constructs the world. Whenever we see things, experience things, hear things, we personalize them. We think it's talking about us. You know? We come into the room, you know, uh, someone talking to a friend, and, and he's looking at you like, and keep on talking, and he's talking about me. But he may be talking about something else. We personalize a lot of things, a lot of the external environment. Second thing that the self tend to do is we magnify things and minimize things. What do we magnify? What do we minimize? We minimize our own flaws and magnify everyone else's. <laughs> How do we do it? Through select, uh, selective attention. <laughs> Recall. You had a nice picnic with your friends, and at the end of the picnic, you had an argument with you know, Joe. And when you recall that memory, that last five minutes ruined the whole day of picnic. Selective attention. Because why? Because of all or nothing type of thinking, exaggeration. Joe is just like that. Every time he just says the same thing. Every time when we're having fun, you know, like this picnic, he just does this. All or nothing. We do this. This is a kind of self-narrative, totally const constructed, that we project out into the world. As soon as we do that, we actually have killed our experience. You know, I have family members that hold grudges for like 10, 20 years. And they haven't seen each other for like 10, 20 years. How do you know that the person hasn't changed? The person has completely changed, but in their mind, in the construct, Uncle Joe, Uncle Joe is just like that. <laughs> just like that, 20 years ago, same, just like that. <laughs> All or nothing. Learn helplessness. Mechanism. Survival tactics that we have learned. They did this experiment at UPenn in which they stimulate this dog in this room. The dog is in a small room, has a door, has an exit. The exit is closed. They stimulate the dog. The dog runs around trying to find the door. Eventually, he just settles into a corner of a room, kind of crouched. Second time, they put the stimulus. I thought this is study done quite, quite a long time ago before the animal rights people you know, <laughs> got on board in the late 20th century, you know, we should protect the animals. I'm not saying they don't do it, but they have to do it. I think they, they can zap the dog or something. <laughs> Anyways, there's this some kind of stimulus. Second time, the dog goes to the same corner. Third time, they open the door, the dog can go out, and they zap the door. They the, the zap the dog, the dog still went back to that corner. This is the next item. Learned helplessness. We do the same. We as a species have learned, and not even as a species, as a, in our own lives, have learned to respond to certain things you know, in a certain way. And uh, every time we encounter that, we just behave the same thing. This is kind of some elementary uh, explanatory style. I'm not going to go into that. The last one is fun mind reading. Oh, we do that all the time. Mind reading. You know, with our friends, we're going to see, what is this person thinking about you? Is this talking about me? Meanwhile, the person can be talking about something else. You know, we construct a whole scenario. Our brain simulates a context, simulates and a situation, and how we relate to that situation, informed by the past. Uh, and we start to read other people's mind. There was a study done with this, in which they did this, they did it to this lady, you know, as an experiment. They use invisible paint to paint on the lady a big ugly mold. Big mold. Ladies usually use makeup that you want to see more on their face. There's all kind of product in the 21st century that tell you how to look young, get rid of the wrinkles and everything. So anyway, they did this uh, to this lady, it's invisible. They showed it on the computer screen, you can see it. But in the mirror, you can't see it. So she's thinking, there's a big mold on her face. It's a kind of social dynamic study. 
And everyone in this, they put her in the middle of a reception party, kind of a dinner reception party, everyone socializing. And um, she starts to interpret things. And behaviorally, so it's a bit different. She starts to talk to people like, Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something like a look the other way, and then when people look at her a certain uh, certain way that she perceives as wrong, she says, oh, "He's he's got something against me. He's he's looking. He's talking about me, or something like that." So we construct the whole story, reading other people's mind, and we behave correspondingly to that. All of us have some mold on our face, right? some more than others. Yeah. Some people think. My mold, my mold is not my problem, it's your problem. It's your mom who's had the problem looking at my mold. I love my mold. I'm just like this. That's the kind of self narrative. I'm not a champ. I'm, I'm just like this. So, all of us have these traits. Now, what is the a business with the Zen here? Uh, what, what, what role does it play? If we were to strip down the, uh, the practice of Zen and, and uh, the significance of Zen, it only has two functions. One, awakening. Awakening to what? To realize the self is an illusion. It's a construct. Simulation. Self is concentrated. If you examine it, even if you examine it intellectually, rationally, you'll be able to see that uh, our views, our opinions, our experiences constantly go through changes. Temporal. And spatially, it's always related to everyone else. Yeah. When I graduated from Princeton, um, um, one, one of my friends says, <clears throat> you know, I've worked so hard for this, I, 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 you know. And I'm there listening to his kind of talk, uh, sitting next to our PhD advisor. Mm -hmm. He's always talking. He's only talking about how hard he worked. He did this. He did that. He works on. Meanwhile, it's our advisor who taught him this, taught him that, taught him this. So, all of our knowledge, all of our experiences, are intimately related to everyone else. We're absorbing and learning and sharing. Right? So, getting a PhD or whatever is just a little capstone. You should be grateful to everything else, because that's the reality. You know. Uh, but people tend to think in a self-referential way, uh, based on this self-narrative. So to realize that the self is actually an illusion, even if you examine it temporally, you examine it spatially, in terms of the experience, knowledge, everything comes from that experience. That's not enough, though. Right? Because you can analyze this and understand that. The real meat Maybe it's not a good analogy. I'm a vegetarian. So the real kind of you know broccoli of this, you know, <laughs> and veggie meat of this is practice. Right? Now practice is the concrete, effective means to actually go through that transformation. Which we'll talk about. Uh, so that's really what Zen is about. Right? Stripped of this kind of religion and, you know, and so on. Rituals. Two things, awakening and practice to realize it. Effective means. Then the on stress is that that self, that construct, we're continually modifying it, continually changing it. Even after this class, your understanding will be a little bit different. We're continually changing it. So there is no fixed notion of self. We will hope you don't have a fixed notion of self. Imagine looking at yourself in a picture, two years old, that's me. And then now you're 30s, 40s, 50s, 20s. You look at that, you will hope that that mind is not your mind now. Yeah. What, what about the body? The body is also changed too. Every part of the bone, every part of the cell, everything has changed. Yeah. We are originally free. That's what Buddha nature means, foreseen. Buddha just means to wake up. It's just Romanized Sanskrit word. This means uh, to wake up. So our nature, to wake up from the illusion or dream of this is some kind of fixed, uh, permanent, separate, independent existence. Uh, we are originally free, but human beings also have imperfect processors. 
the way in the way that we are wired to construct a self-reference. The point is not that after enlightenment, a person no longer, the brain no longer construct a self. You walk into a space, you have no spatial recognition anymore. Like right? I'm here, you're there. No. The brain still functions. The brain is still able to, all of your experiences, your knowledge, your intellect are greatly valued. You know, who we are, your feelings are greatly valued, except you no longer are under or subjected like a puppet under these constructs. Most people are. We think we have autonomy, it's my opinion, my I will to do that. But really you just under the influence like a puppet of the external environment, your education. So you have this kind of strong sense of opinion. Right? Um, you can actually see from more perspective, more angles, because you're not stuck with this one track mind on you know, your way of seeing things. You can actually see things much more clear, much more clear from multiple pr perspectives. Sympathize with other people's perspective because you're not in the middle of it. You know? have you, how many of you go to like board meetings and uh, in, in your work you have a lot of meetings with other people? How many of you have that? Haven't you like be, sometimes being meetings in which some people just come up with ideas that's totally like self-referential. It's like so clearly, like, everyone see it except that person. You know? Some opinions or su suggestions that were kind of benefit themselves. The practice or the, or the realization if a person is good at Zen practice, they will remove themselves. Stop putting themselves in the center of all of the decision and then see things, what is needed, what is actually needed by this company, by this project and so on. And not get so stuck. Should you have opinions? Of course. Our brain is able to have opinions, but when you give opinion, you don't say, no, you have to take my opinion. You can actually synthesize, right? And blend in with, uh, uh, to come up with the best view, right? So all the, our, our strength is still present. All the weaknesses centered on the culprit. This false understanding of things. Let's go. Right? That's it. Now, awakening. Some analogies. This is some this traditional, some I, I came up with. Is that the room and the furniture? Right? Most of us just stop looking at the furniture. When we come into the room, if the room is a mess, we feel good. Oh, that's not good. The room is clean, pleasant, peaceful, we're all kind of like happy. Right? That's because we're stuck at the furniture. We're stuck at looking at the people in there, the, the cushions and so on. But actually, it doesn't matter from the perspective of the space here. It doesn't really matter if the room is cluttered. Or the room is clean. The space is open and free. In fact, it's because there's no rigidity of space that we can move furniture around. You understand? Same thing. The furniture is our wandering thoughts, scattered thoughts, our opinion, our experiences. It doesn't matter what we have. Intelligent, not so intelligent. It doesn't matter. Our true nature is free. Our true nature is free. The nature of our mind. Because it's originally without the imprint of a fixed sense of self. Just like a mirror. Imagine a, a mirror and you etch a permanent image of something in the mirror. Then uh, whatever that comes in front of it, it's kind of juxtaposed with this image. You can't see things too clearly. But the mirror originally has no fixed image. It's we ourselves who hold that image and don't let go. Right? But you have to, like, I'm holding this, right? You gotta let go. Then your hand is free to grab anything. You see? If you don't let go, how can you grab? I can only really punch. And that's what we do. We just punch all the people around us. <laughs> you know, you get in conflict, and then that. You gotta let go. Shake hands, right? Or like the water and the salt. This is a sutra analogy. So the water, very dirty inside, but the nature of water doesn't change. 
Mutual Mortals Wetness. That's his intro.